Welcome. What a treat it is to be here again today. It's amazing in the years that I've had the opportunity to be here to see the amount of change that's occurred both in the conference as well as what's happened in the space and the enterprise. Before I introduce General Whiting this morning, I need to explain a little bit of how we're going to handle the questions and answers. I will ask Doug Levero, who to orchestrate this session after General Whiting completes his remarks. Most of you know Doug for many different jobs that he's held in the past in the space business. His participation in the Amos conferences as the prior Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Space Policy and of course on Monday as a key mentor for the Emergen mentoring session. Thank you, Doug, for all the support that you continue to provide. Now for the task at hand. It's important to understand that during the years since 9-11, the changes in space capabilities and demands for space information has continually grown both military and commercial space exponentially. This trend will continue, and as the world dynamics have also changed, this administration has moved from a terrorist-based focus to deterrence and support to joint operations and a mission focus. In both of these missions areas, it is the capabilities that the current space and future planned space systems make all of this possible. Without space, none of this would be available to our national leaders, and it's crucial for people to understand the importance of that. To understand these expectations, it's also important that you understand that the terminology is finally coalescing into common terms rather than everybody having different terms, or different meanings for the same terms. And I commend all of you to read the latest edition of April edition of the Joint JCS Pub 3-14 on space. This new doctrine will drive future needs and operational changes. Some of this new thinking and changes are directly attributable to our keynote speaker. Major General Steve Whiting was one of the key individuals in the development of General Heighton's space enterprise vision, a new foundational construct for more responsive space operations. Today, General Whiting serves as both deputy Joint Force Component Commander for STRATCOM and Commander of the 14th Air Force. In his role as the Deputy Joint Force Component Commander for STRATCOM, he organizes and operates the Air Force, Army, and Navy Joint Operations Center that contributes to the 24-7 deterrence and support of all joint operations. As Commander of the 14th Air Force, his responsibility is to train equipment forces that participate in these operations. As an honor graduate of the Air Force Academy and five other key military schools and his continual involvement in space operations at multiple levels, this so makes him thus qualified. So without further ado, Major General Steve Whiting. Thank you, Kirk. Appreciate that. The year is 1805. The French Empire is the dominant military land power of Europe, and its newly crowned emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, is determined to invade Britain. Napoleon's navy has successfully evaded Britain's royal blockades to team up with Spain. Together, they have created a massive Franco-Spanish armada consisting of 33 battleships, to include the largest and heaviest armed men of war ever built in the Age of Sail. Now with this fleet, Napoleon finally has what he needs to engage the British Royal Navy head on, the last remaining obstacle stopping him from taking control of the English Channel, landing his army on British shores and claiming supremacy over all of Europe. It was exactly this week, 213 years ago, that Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson received his orders to take command of British naval forces and intercept Napoleon's massive Franco Spanish Armada. He was outnumbered and outgunned, but Nelson and his officers had more experience in battle and an acute grasp of strategy. With the fate of Britain on the line, Admiral Nelson led one of the most important naval battles in history, and he delivered a crushing victory. He managed to capture or destroy two-thirds of the Franco-Spanish Armada, but even more impressively, Nelson won the battle without losing a single ship in his fleet. Now with that single battle, the Battle of Trafalgar, Nelson saved his country from Napoleon's invasion and secured British Royal Naval dominance for another century. But it is how he did it, by departing from prevailing strategy 
and turning to the decentralized problem solving and talents of his captains, that is the most important lesson I have taken away from his victory. This is the same lesson I want to share with you this morning because I believe it applies to our domain and our profession now more than ever. Aloha, good morning ladies and gentlemen and thank you, or should I say mahalo, for allowing me to be your keynote speaker for the 19th Annual Amos Conference. I truly am honored to be with you this morning and I really was excited to hear about the continued growth and the incredible impact of this conference. Now as we kick off, I want to give you my perspective on space situational awareness and the role it plays in our rapidly changing military space enterprise, as Kirk alluded to. My goal is to help illuminate the strategic context of the work we are all doing so that you can see how significant your contributions are to the dramatic operational shift that is happening right now. I also talk, want to talk about what the Air Force is doing to evolve our space situational awareness capabilities and discuss a challenge that I am hoping we can all tackle together. Now, the Air Force has always played a leading role in this community. And this past year sets a precedent for how interested we are as a nation in space. On December 1st of last year, United States Strategic Command stood up the Joint Force Space Component Command, replacing a venerable organization known as the Joint Force Space Component for space. Now this change continued the evolution of space as a primary warfighting domain on par with the other warfighting domains of land, sea, air, and cyber. Now on paper, the change seems trivial, simply reordering some similar words, but from an organizational perspective, this move was exceptional because it continued the process of elevating space to the highest levels of national strategic attention. This change implicitly makes SSA, the work we all do, among the most important missions contributing to the security of the United States and our allies. This gradual evolution of space priority is a necessary one now, as General Hyten, the commander of the United States Strategic Command, pointed out last year when he stood up the GIFSIC, or the Joint Force Space Component Command, our potential adversaries get a vote, and they voted when they deployed certain capabilities that we have to respond to with a warfighting organization. Now, like it or not, we are entangled with a rapidly evolving threat that is changing our calculus and changing the way we have to think about space. For decades, we knew who our neighbors on orbit were, and we could understand their norms of behavior, which in turn shaped our own norms of behavior. But space is no longer a sanctuary. And if we want to evolve our mission set to match this new threat, we also have to evolve our legacy or, uh, operations. This is the reason why I brought up the Battle of Trafalgar, because Admiral Nelson wrestled with a very similar situation 213 years ago. He witnessed a new and unpredictable threat growing on the horizon challenging Britain's superiority over their strongest military domain, the sea. And the same principle that held true back then still holds true today. Superiority over any domain is not a birthright. Every country must earn it and constantly evolve to maintain it. I think we should pay attention to Admiral Nelson's example, who was willing to depart from prevailing doctrine and change Britain's strategy in response to the growing threat. It's clear, given the national dialogue, that our entire national security leadership structure is convinced we have reached a strategic inflection point for national security space. We see national level policy continuing to align vision, strategy, leadership, and resources across the national space enterprise. Our national security strategy reiterates that, quote, unfettered access to and freedom to operate in space is a vital national interest. And further, any harmful interference with or an attack upon critical components of our space architecture that directly affects vital U.S. interests will be met with a deliberate response at a time, place, manner, and domain of our choosing." Unquote. Now, acting upon that guidance, the National Defense Strategy formally recognizes space as a warfighting domain. As these changes to national guidance are being made, we as a community need to ensure our enterprise SSA efforts are aligned. The tra transition begins with the delineation of military and non-military SSA functions through Space Policy Directive 3, which calls for the Department of Defense and the Department of Commerce to cooperatively develop a construct for managing the provision of basic SSA and space traffic management services. Now, while the implementation clearly states the Secretary of Defense shall maintain the U.S. authoritative catalog of space objects, it also calls for the Secretary of Commerce 
to make basic space flight space pardon me, make basic spaceflight safety support services available and develop best practices for SSA data dissemination and space traffic management services. On the military side, we have already begun to change our tactics and align SSA efforts for warfighting. The Air Force teamed up with the National Reconnaissance Office to write a space situational awareness and indications and warning concept of operations. This concept of operation paints the broad strokes for our vision of enterprise-level SSA to support warfighting. We also transition the National Space Defense Center in Colorado Springs from an experimental unit to a functioning 24 7 by 365 operations center. This will improve our ability to rapidly detect, warn, characterize, attribute, and defend against threats to our nation's most vital space systems. We also strengthened our partnership with our foreign allies by transforming our Joint Space Operations Center into the Combined Space Operator, uh, pardon me, Combined Space Operations Center. Just like in any other domain, if we were to get into a conflict in space, a conflict we do not seek, we will do so with our al allies. By standing up the CSPOC, we're enacting the strong teamwork we have with our partners from Australia, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Our goal is to pursue the integration of these countries and others. We want to add their unique capabilities into our common enterprise and deepen our SSA sharing relationships. Now, everything I just described happened since my predecessor, Lieutenant General Dave Buck, spoke to you last year. I hope this shows you how serious we are about evolving to support space warfighting and how important SSA is to that process. As we continue to grow, we need to be willing to change the way we think about certain mission sets. But what General Buck told you last year will always remain the same. SSA is foundational to everything. He said, if we don't get SSA right, it doesn't matter what we do for command and control. Without domain awareness, even the best battle management command and control system is useless. Now, as we make this transition, we are lucky to have an outstanding foothold to start from. That is, we have the experts in this room who designed and built many of the tools we use for SSA today. This audience is a testament to our unmatched commercial, academic, civil, military, and allied participation in the field of space situational awareness. You are the very best. And because of this partnership, I want to spend some time talking about what 14th Air Force is doing in SSA right now. As you know, starting with our telescopes on top of Haleakala, our 20th Space Control Squadron operates the Air Force's most capable operational ground-based electro-optical deep space surveillance network, and they're partnered with our Air Force Research Lab teammates there on the mountain. We have a modernization program underway to upgrade these telescopes and add another site in Europe. In addition to GEODs, our first space operations squadron flies the Air Force's most capable space-based surveillance system, or SBSS. We are also working with joint mission partners to develop another space-based SSA platform called Silent Barker. This program sets a precedent for collaboration with the National Reconnaissance Office to design and build systems that satisfy enterprise-level SSA requirements, not just individual requirements. This past year, we also launched the innovative new spacecraft called ORS-5, or Operationally Responsive Space-5, developed by the Space Rapid Capabilities Office at Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico. It has only been a few months since we operationally accepted this spacecraft, but it has already impressed us with its ability to outperform some capabilities of our legacy systems for only a fraction of the cost. And for our most pressing threats, when diffraction-limited optics are simply not sufficient to meet our needs, the first space operations squadron continues to fly the Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program, or GSAP. Now, as General Hyten has said, the GSAP program allows us to know that there will be no secrets in GEO. This mission strengthens our strategic deterrence by letting our competitors know how we can overcome the physical limits of our telescopes, so there's no point in trying to deceive us. We're improving our ground-based radar systems as well. After Space Fence comes online next year, we have a partnership with the Missile Defense Agency to use their long-range discrimination radar for SSA support. And we've already started planning for a deep space advanced radar concept, 
a radar powerful enough to overcome propagation loss and detect, track, and maintain custody of objects in deep space orbit. With all these sensors in our portfolio, we need a new battle management system to command and control. So we are entering a partnership across three Air Force agencies on a program called Enterprise Space Battle Management Command and Control, or ESBMC2. This system will leverage the proven success of open mission system architectures and uniform command and control interfaces seen in the air breathing world. Having a common interface will enable our applications to be fueled by industry consortium, built for speed, innovation, and multi-domain integration. Now I could talk a lot longer about the money we are investing into improving our SSA systems, but I only have a limited amount of time, so I want to take a moment to talk about the main challenge we need your help with. That challenge is leveraging commercial, industry, and other external sources to build a foundational layer of SSA services. Commercial industry is redundant and decentralized, free to innovate without permission, allowing you to be faster at making decisions, better at taking risks, less restricted by centralized federal acquisition regulations, and more adaptable to our diverse and rapidly changing needs. Now this brings me back to the key lesson from Admiral Nelson in the Battle of Trafalgar. As I said before, it is how Nelson defeated the Franco-Spanish Armada, by departing from prevailing strategy and turning to the decentralized problem-solving and talents of his captains. That is the most important lesson I have taken away from his victory. You see, back in 1805, naval warfare was fought with rigid and centralized command and control. Each fleet would assemble themselves in parallel lines and fire broadside after broadside until the defeated side retreated or surrendered. But Nelson and Britain simply could not afford to follow these legacy naval tactics. Nelson's fleet was more than 20% smaller than the Franco-Spanish Armada. And even if he could force his opponent to retreat, they would simply repair, regroup, and attack the English Channel later. Britain needed to regain their unquestionable superiority over the seas which meant Nelson needed to deliver a decisive victory. So Nelson created a plan that anticipated the Franco-Spanish Armada would follow traditional naval tactics. And rather than assembling his fleet to form a parallel line, Nelson split his fleet into two separate squadrons and sailed straight at his opponent's broadside. This cut the Franco-Spanish line into three pieces and triggered a very disorderly battle. Amidst the chaos and confusion, British captains isolated each enemy battleship individually, overwhelming them one by one before the unengaged ships farther down the line could support. It was a brilliant maneuver, but in order for it to work, Nelson had to do something quite radical for an 18th century commander. Days before the battle, he invited all 27 of his captains to his flagship, instructed them on the details of his secret plan and gave them complete authority to maneuver however they needed within the ensuing chaos. With these orders, Nelson departed from more than two centuries of rigidly controlled, centralized naval tactics. He relinquished the authority given to him by the crown and delegated it to his captains with these simple but profound instructions. Quote, no man can do very wrong so long as he places his ship alongside that of the enemy. The reason why I want to share this story is because I believe the decentralized nature of this forum, where military, civil, commercial, academic, and allied partners collaborate together, is just as strategically valuable to our profession as it was to Nelson's. I believe it is exactly what we need to posture ourselves to meet the looming challenges of the future and maintain space superiority. We have entered the age of reusable rockets of rapidly decreasing cost of space access leading to exponentially increasing rates of adoption. Low cost, low weight CubeSats, even microsats, will enable mega constellations that will stress our SSA capabilities. My staff calls this a modern day manifest destiny. I call it the second golden age of space, signaling an entirely new economic, scientific, and operational dynamic. And hiding in the shadows of the status quo our competitors preparing to challenge our superiority in this domain. But we have American innovation. That is one of the reasons our country and our military are the envy of the world. The largest constellation of operational satellites is a privately owned American company, imaging the planet every day, delivering what is effectively geospatial intelligence as a service. 
Likewise, the largest network of ground-based telescopes performing Deep Space SSA is also a privately owned company. And what is soon to be the largest network of ground-based S-band radars performing high-precision LEO SSA, you guessed it, it's a privately owned American company. You are the world's most rapidly growing and capable space industry. And your decentralized nature allows you to attack diverse SSA problem sets individually, just like the captains in Nelson's fleet. You can multiply our ability to provide foundational SSA for a fraction of the cost it takes us to develop, integrate, operate, and maintain our own centralized solutions. You can improve our services, increase our knowledge, tackle every angle of the problem, and can do all this while tilling fertile ground for further innovation. My goal is to utilize foreign, commercial, academic, and interagency SSA data and services more than we ever have before. It hasn't been easy to depart from legacy tactics where we rely exclusively on our own tightly controlled centralized systems, but we are collectively moving in the right direction. We've made progress to enable a better mix of government-developed programs coupled with emerging commercial capabilities. We developed a non-traditional data integration concept to address the question of how to incorporate external SSA data sources into the Joint Force Space component. And two weeks after that concept was signed, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics released formal guidance for faster acquisition activities using rapid prototyping, borrowing from the proven be best practices in the commercial sector. This guidance requires agile software development and operations, or DevOps, for all new initiatives across the Air Force. Meanwhile, back in Colorado Springs, the National Space Defense Center has postured itself to support DevOps with a shadow operations center. They've partnered with the Air Force Research Lab to award experimental contracts to non-traditional vendors using a new process established by the Defense Innovation Unit. And down the street from the National Space Defense Center, the Catalyst Campus for Technology is doing the same thing, performing customer discovery, prioritizing continual learning, executing an agile release framework in a collaborative ecosystem where industry, entrepreneurs, and venture capital intersect with defense. I ask for your continued partnership as we move forward with all of these changes. Please leverage our open mission system and uniform command and control interfaces we are building and start making applications on top of our architecture. And if we're moving too slowly in the chaos, remember Nelson's lesson. Nobody can do very wrong so long as they place their ship alongside the enemy. Innovate without permission. Turn your sensors to the sky and discover new problems. Isolate them and solve them individually and use what you learn to help us preserve space, uh, peace in the space domain. I ask for your patience with the Air Force and the US government as a whole while we work through the inevitable hurdles that come with reorganizing our space enterprise and smartly incorporating external data and services. We have more rocks to break loose and more outdated processes to modernize. But as I pointed out earlier, our work is gaining the attention of the national stage and we have a lot of support. The Air Force Chief of Staff has said it's time for the United States Air Force as a service, regardless of specialty badge, to embrace space superiority with the same passion and sense of ownership that we apply to our air superiority mission today. I think this sentiment applies to everyone who works on space mi mission sets, not just within the Air Force, but for everyone here, because the Air Force and soon United States Space Command will have no choice but to federate work to our commercial, academic, civil, and allied partners, and rely on you for foundational support. Mahalo again for the invitation to speak today and for coming together to create a continuous, open, and engaging dialogue. I am honored to be surrounded by so many influ influential thought leaders in SSA and so many talented people performing research and development at the forefront of the new space revolution. I look forward to talking to many of you during the course of the conference. Aloha.